congratulations on fin finishing your board game this month and the efforts you've had. And there's four speaker of us here to talk about kind of uh, what are the next steps and, and answer some questions you might have. Uh, my name is Tim Fowers. Uh, I made a game called Paperback and a game called uh, Burgle Bros. And uh, this is um, Seth Jaffe. I'm, I've made a game called Eminent Domain as well as another game called Terra Prime. And I've been a developer on a, a lot of the Tasty Visual Games products. And I'm Dan Keltner. Uh, I'm a, I've designed a couple games, uh, Bomb Squad and Isle of Trains. I'm Ryan Lockett, uh, publisher of Red Raven Games. I've done Above and Below and uh, Eight Minute Empire for two of my best known games. All right. Um, so uh, we got some. We have some questions um, from the, from the audience, and we're going to kind of go through answering them. So. Um, now that these designers have a working prototype of their game, what are possible next steps for them? So, the big division here is uh, some of us work with publishers, some of us self-publish. And so, let's hear from the, the publisher side. So, uh, well, one, one thing you can do with your game now that you've finished it is to uh, pitch it to a publisher. Uh, and the things that go into that are uh, finding publishers, uh, making your pitch, and um, Working on uh, work, working with them to, to bring your game to the market. Um, yeah, and then self-publishing is a lot of the same development, but uh, you're going to have to do more of it on your own. So you're going to have to find your artwork. You're going to have to continue to develop your game, and then start to to, to ramp up. Generally, the Kickstarter is the, is the advice. I don't see a lot of reasons not to do Kickstarter, um, and because you, you've got to you've got to print it somehow. Um, but there are some other options. Um, there's some print-on-demand services we'll talk about later. But uh, so th these are kind of the two sides of it. So, uh, so how do you how do you kind of reach out to a to a publisher? Well, Dan, how do you? Well, so a couple different things from my experience. Um, so, um, I think it makes a a big difference to actually be connected before you're ready um, to actually want to pitch a particular game. So, the more you're involved in the community, the more you know other other uh, people that are publishers, uh, the more you've attended and met them at conventions, you've helped other people, that uh, builds those connections before you even get to the point of saying, hey, I've got this game, you know, will you take a look at it, right? It's a lot easier for somebody to, to be willing to say yes if they know you than if uh, it's just some random box in the mail. Um, but I think a lot of it, you need to, you also need to know the audience of who you're reaching out to, right? You, you got to know what that publisher is interested in, right? And whether you're a good fit. It's just kind of like a job interview, right? You don't want to come in and not know anything about the company or the job that you're going for, right? You want to know what they are and, and you know what their focus is and and uh, show that that you're a good fit for that and your game design's a good fit for that. Well, go ahead. That's a that's a uh, very good point. And so um, part of becoming part of the community and learn and meeting the people involved. Uh, most publishers are small operations, and they themselves, the, the, the head honcho of each of lots of published companies, are at conventions, and you can meet them, and you can talk to them, and you can, um, you know, learn about their company or know about the company ahead of time. Um, and so, it's respectful to, of course, pitch games that are, on, are only ones that are likely to be part of their line or they're, they're going to like, rather than just pitch whatever you got to whatever publisher and see if somebody says yes. Um, but that that'll. Uh, really increase the likelihood that they'll like your game and uh, as Dan said if you uh, have a relationship with an individual personal relationship with the publisher beforehand you'll have a lot easier time kind of getting in front of them getting a game in front of them uh, alternatively you can do what I did which was wait 10 years for your best friend to open a publishing company and then they'll publish your game <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's one that's option that's plan B um, at these conventions uh, Gen Con is one of the biggest ones to get to to get in front of a lot of publishers and uh, there are some events run by James Math, which are publisher speed dating. Uh, and if you can get on the list for this thing, there's it's like speed dating. You're showing your your game really quickly to a whole bunch, a whole stream of publishers to come through. Uh, those events are really good. Um, I'd probably put any kind of convention publishing over just uh, pitch by mail, um, kind of mail it to the publisher and hope that they, you know, uh, understand what you're trying to communicate. So in person really helps communicate what you're trying to do with the game. Um, so, uh, so self-publishing, um, the, the work involved with that is, uh, there, there's a, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, pieces to that. And so, uh, networking with other, uh, designers, and that's what we're actually doing this weekend. We're down in Tucson, we're all helping each other on designs and, uh, and 
having a, having people that can give you really uh, really um, informed feedback about your design is critical. Because uh, I've I've had problems in past games where I was just on my own. I'm a lone wolf, and I just sat there and polished that stone, and I kind of just went too far, and I didn't have anybody to tell me, no, 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 stop. It's good like this, and because uh, often you, you'll just go too far. So uh, so really, um, getting a, a set of other designers or or play testers that 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 have you know strong opinions about about your game is is really good to have that resistance. Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> So going back to Kickstarter, I mean, it's, it's a ton of work, and you have to know you're going to need to rely on a lot of people to help you. I think it's, it's common for people to say, you know, I don't, need, I don't need publishers, I don't need anybody, I don't need any friends, I just want to publish my game, you know, I can do it all myself. And, I, you know, I have that, I've had that feeling a lot myself, because I do all the art for my games, and I do all the design, and I publish it myself, so I can understand the feeling. But um, you got to know, like, you're not going to know everything about shipping, and you're not going to be able to warehouse the whole thing, and you're going to need to rely on um, the opinions of, of, of other players to know, if, you know, to know if it's working. And, um, you, you know, you got to seek out the, the right people to help you, so. Yeah. Uh, we're, we'll go through a couple more questions. Um, uh, what are the, some of the benefits and constraints of print-on-demand services? Um, there are some designers, like Andy Solis, who have been doing uh, drive through cards, which is just kind of like you can order on the website. Game Crafter has a similar service. Um, and those are starting to become more viable. Um, and they're kind of like, if you kind of can get the artwork and get it to a good state and you just want it out now, that'll work. Um, the Kickstarters are a lot of work, but in the end, you know, you can make, you can just get a much bigger reach with, with like a Kickstarter campaign um, when it comes to uh, versus print on demand. Now I use print on demand services quite a bit, for getting getting a, a game that I'm getting close to Kickstarter to get copies to reviewers, to uh, blind play testers, like all those other steps that you have, being able to quickly say, oh cool, I'm just gonna order another one and, and ship it off to that person, um, saves you having to build another version of it. So print on demand services, I, I, I really appreciate, um, but as, as kind of a business, uh, the margins aren't quite there for, uh, for sustainability as a, as a business. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of designers I, I talked to uh, have started using the print-on-demand services for their prototypes, so they have nicer looking prototypes. Uh, this is something that you could do. I, I kind of recommend against it usually, um, especially early prototypes because it gets costly and sure it saves you some printer ink, but it gets costly and you're likely to change your prototype and then what are you going to order another $30 game from Game Crafter to, yeah. so you play it again? Uh, so. It's attractive to want to have a pretty prototype so people will play it, and that is helpful. But until you're really close to finish with your game, I recommend against print-on-demand services for prototypes um, that you're just going to play and, and write on and, and throw a piece, piece away. Um, but once you get to the point where, uh, like Tim said, if you're going to send it out to review copies so you can get videos made for your Kickstarter or so you can have um, you know, large-scale blind testing done when you really think you're done, um, then it starts to make more sense. Uh, for that. Um, let's see, uh, next question. Uh, what are the best ways to generate buzz around a new game? How important are festivals and conventions, and what are best strategies for approaching them? So, for me, you know, self-publishing, I have to generate my own buzz. I have to uh, be out there playtesting with people, and so I try to get, um, even when I'm at an early stage, get um, some influencers, like um, YouTube reviewers and stuff, uh, maybe I can catch them at a convention, uh, to to play the game and and how that's useful later on is uh, When I'm doing my Kickstarter page, I can say hey, could you give me a blurb like a one sentence? You know, hey, this is a, this really is a great game um, That really helps with buzz because when people are looking at your Kickstarter They just want to be you know, can I trust this guy? Is this game any good? So if you can actually have it out there at different conventions and get different people's kind of opinions on it, and people will also share on their own They'll be like man. I played the new game from what's his name and and it was really great um, and, and you encourage them to share about it, um, maybe not you know, too specifically, depending on, on, on where you're at in the game, but you know, pretty openly talking about it and say, this is my next thing, and getting people kind of prepared for, your, for your, this upcoming thing uh, through, uh, through conventions. So um, you know, the strategic cons and the Kubla cons and all of your local cons, and then your big ones like, like Origins and, and, uh, and Gen Con uh, are, are, are kind of essential to get to. Um, other than that, I mean, 
Uh, there are some online networks like on Board Game Geek. You can you can kind of get uh, get some buzz going there with uh, you know creating your your game page and getting you know people to post there about having played it. So, um, but it can be hard, especially when you you're starting from zero. Um, don't worry too much about just just make a really good game, um, and then you'll find that it can kind of spread on its own. Um, Frequently, when you hear Kickstarter advice, people say that. Um, it's, it's similar, how do you create buzz about your Kickstarter, similar to how to create buzz about your game, is uh, the advice is to build the tribe ahead of time, uh, do game reviews, do videos or blog, or uh, be in the community, post on board game, do whatever you can to get a following, and then when it's time to release your game, or start to uh, let people know about it, you'll have people you can talk to you about that. You can, you can let them, you can have people who are listening to you when you say, hey, I got this new game, and, and they'll be excited to hear about it. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, how important is it to maintain secrecy about an unpublished game? Uh, what should be made public and when? Um, so I'm not a lawyer, and I'm also um, not in the video game industry, so my answer to this question is that it doesn't make any sense to keep things secret, really, um, for most, especially most amateur designers. And this kind of ties right back into what um, Tim was just saying a minute ago, is if you... Um, if you're keeping your game a secret, then how can you tell anybody that, it, that it's coming out? Yeah. Um, now, that maybe applies more to like when it's in development and you're just working on a game. When you're done with your game and you're looking to get it published, um, I've never really understood the, hey, let's keep, keep it a secret until this launch date or whatever, um, because maybe I'm not in a position that that matters. Um, I know that they do that with big releases in, in the video game industry, and maybe they do it, maybe Fantasy Flight that keeps their big Star Wars game under wraps until it shows up at Gen Con. Uh, but that's much different scale than, than a, an amateur designer getting their first game out. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and having been in the video game industry too, where there's this kind of this paranoia about cloning um, and whatnot, it just doesn't happen in board games. It's just it's economically not feasible for anybody to really copy your game, um, and and the whole community is actually pretty healthy in how much we borrow from each other. Like someone will come up with a new mechanic, and I'll use it, but I'll use it in a different way, and and it, we don't feel the same kind of like cut through a competition, and so we don't feel like we need to be really close about it uh, for economic reasons, and then also just for, for design reasons. It's like, if you can kind of open up about it, then you'll get the feedback that you really do need, even though you may not think you need it, uh, the sooner the better. Uh, let's see. Um, as a new designer, what do you think is the very best way to get noticed? Well, there are a couple ways. Um, one way, which I have I admit I haven't used it myself, are contests. and. Um, Honestly, it's a great way to, to talk to publishers because often publishers are the ones that are judging the contest, that you know, game design contest. So submit your design um, to these contests and um, it, it'll open up doors for you. Uh, you know, and I, another way I've seen a lot of people do is, um, you know, they sort of, maybe, maybe they're not ready to commit to Kickstarter. Um, it's, it seems like a huge thing and, you know, they're having a hard time talking to publishers. We talked about the speed dating thing where you can go and talk to publishers at conventions. That's, that's a way to get noticed, but I've noticed some success with people releasing their game as a sort of a print and play thing. They build up a following and over time, um, you know, maybe their next design that they do, and, and maybe it's the same game in the, in, in the same series, um, has a big following, then they do a big Kickstarter and, and it's very successful, so. Cool. To, to piggyback off that too, so I, I've, uh, part of my experience has been with a couple different design contests and um, been fortunate enough to, uh, to you know, be in the final winning group for, for some of those. Um, and so uh, it obviously goes a long way, right? And even for most of these contests, even if you don't win, you get tremendous feedback and visibility usually. And, and uh, you almost always, I think, are going to come out with a better product of that than what you went in with. And I think, you know, really, it, it goes back to um, something you mentioned earlier about kind of, you know, reaching out to other people in the industry, like YouTubers and, you know, video reviewers and stuff. I think all of it, for, Buzz is all really built around um, coming from a source that people trust, right? So that could be an individual, right, that they, you know, have a lot of people watch their reviews and agree with them. It could be um, people on Twitter that they follow that play the same games and they see the same same pictures of a game that they're really interested in. It could be a, a known uh, 
group of people for a contest or whatever that says, you know, hey, we've done this for a number of years, like Hippo Dice was the one I did this last year and, and uh, uh, got a special prize for my uh, Queen Anne Revenge um, design. Um, but that's kind of established in the industry, right? And that's par uh, partners with publishers. And so if you get your name in that, that's a big deal. You know, that, uh, um, that's kind of an established trust source, right? So people will say, okay, hey, that, you know, that's worth looking at. Um, and also to that point, I really recommend any kind of game design contest you can do because it makes you finish. It gives you a deadline. Because so often you'll be like, no, 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 it's not done yet, or it's not the right time yet. And that, that forces you to be like, no, nope, it's got to be ready. And, and so often, we'll, we'll, as, as a designer, you want to push up. And so, you know, giving yourself those kind of deadlines through contests or through other external things like, okay, I'm going to kickstart by this date, and you just give yourself the date, um, makes a world of difference. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, how do you know when, if you're ready to pitch your game to, uh, or, or go to Kickstarter? So I have uh, some opinions on this. Um, I really tell people uh, my advice for, for whether you're ready to pitch your game, uh, and I, I, would, I would say that if you're ready to pitch your game and go to Kickstarter, I think it's the same thing, uh, is you know if you're done, if you, uh, if you are happy with it as it is, like if, if someone bought it on the shelf and it had nice art because someone hired an artist, but game-wise, if, if, if the experience that of well, playing the game, if you're completely 100% happy with that, uh, then it's done and you're ready to pitch it to publishers. And then at that point, you still have to expect the publisher is going to maybe make some tweaks or some changes or some development. Uh, if you go into it, uh, I don't recommend pitching to publishers uh, with a game that you don't think is finished and needs some development, expecting them to do the development. At that point, I, I wouldn't call that done, and I would recommend it's not time to pitch yet. And I especially recommend it's not time to go to Kickstarter yet, because... If you do pitch a game that needs some development to a publisher, it might get developed. If you go to Kickstarter and, and don't finish it, then it's not going to, people are going to get an unfinished game. So uh, I've noticed some, sometimes people, uh, they, they think they're very close to being done and they think, okay, this is pretty good. I'm going to go pitch it now. And if it's not finished, then it it's, uh, might end up being a waste of, of people's time. So I would say make sure that you're happy with the game as is, but then also don't be upset if somebody says, "Hey, we're gonna we'd like to publish it, but we want to make these these development yeah. changes." Well, and I know Seth does a ton of development on other people's games, and part of this whole process is like, especially if you get in with publishers, is really be open to uh, to that kind of help and that and that feedback because in the end, you could end up with a much better game than you thought because they're going to open up kind of doors that you didn't think about or directions, uh, and just be open to that because sometimes. You know, you'd be developing something and, 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 and get feedback from this developer at the publisher and you're like, well, I don't agree with them. And you need to kind of be open because you might be kind of stuck in this, in this little valley and there's, some, uh, there's, a bigger, there's a bigger outcome out there, but you're, you're just kind of stuck here because you don't want to change certain things about the game. So I think being open, is, uh, when, especially when working with a publisher, is important. I think uh, another uh, <laughs> thing too, I think we all have a lot of good input on this one. Um, uh, my background a lot is in uh, software projects, and I think there's a good uh, comparison in this. It is, you know, you finish coding the software, you don't just throw it out there and everybody starts using it, right? There's a whole series and kind of escalating level of testing that you would typically do to validate that it really is meeting what you intended to do in the first place. And same kind of thing here, right? You know, if, if it's a, hey, I played it twice and I think it's ready to go to a publisher, you know, have, you know, what level of kind of play testing yourself, what kind of play testing with a variety of groups, testing the different variables, you know, really kind of evaluating different pieces of it, both at a structural level and at a balancing level, what kind of blind play testing of it, you know, what kind of testing with different player groups or different types. I think you really need to have a good, well-rounded sense of how, how it's working and enough data coming back to you that says, this isn't just my view of the world that everything looks great and it's working well, but I've also got other independent feedback that's helped validate that it's ready. Um, and I think that's a key thing before you say, okay, hey, I think it's worth looking at publishing. For me, it's, um, it's kind of an emotional thing. So uh, I'll play the, if, I'll know a game is ready if I play it with, you know, many different groups and when I watch the group's reaction um, if it's generally positive and happy while they're playing the game that kind of tells me if it's ready you know after the game is over people are always going to have things to say about it 
Um, but um, it's it's very helpful if you watch players sort of their temperament when they're playing the game, how they're reacting to it, how you know how generally it, it seems like everyone's feeling about it. Um, you know, how, do they want to play it again? That's that's a, a good one um, to know if it's if it's ready to go. Yeah, yeah that that, uh, that emotional reaction is is, is key. Um, and then the feedback you mentioned afterwards, when you start seeing comments that are that you feel like when you analyze it, when you think about it, that this would make the game different, but not necessarily better, then you're, when, when all your comments are kind of that type, then maybe you're, you're getting close to done. Whereas every time you play the game with a different group, if you get comments and you're like, oh yeah, that, that would be an improvement, maybe you're not done yet. Maybe you can still improve the game. But when your comments are, okay, that's uh, different, but not necessarily better, then you feel like maybe maybe that's when you've, you've finally gotten it all to the point you wanted it. So. Well, cool. Uh, well, thanks, guys. Uh, we we wish you guys well. Um, all, we're all available. Uh, we're actually on on Twitter, I believe. I'm I'm, I'm T -F at T Fowers on Twitter. At Central. Uh, Keltner Dam. At Red Raven Game without an S. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Just one. Yeah. Just one. Just and only one game. <laughs> <laughs> it's over and over. <laughs> and and uh, and and we, we you know we, we you can reach out to us and and uh, and you know give feedback uh, and we're we're kind of. We want to grow the developer community and the designer community, and uh, and we hope wish you guys well on your on your projects and uh, keep at it. Uh, thanks a lot.